everyone. Hello, hello, hello. It's so great to be back on stage. This is years. It's a little weird. It's years, but it's nice <laughs> to see everyone here. It's nice that everyone is watching us online. We have a bunch of stuff to show you today. Uh, we're talking about stuff from the era of .NET 6, 6 and, 7. and .NET 7, which is not out yet. Hopefully, you've all been playing with .NET 7 as we've been building it this year. RC2 came out last week, yesterday, yeah. yesterday, okay. yesterday. Yep. Um, and so we've got a bunch of stuff uh, to show you. I'm going to switch over. We don't have any slides, because I was told no slides, so I didn't do any slides. Uh, but we have a bunch of stuff to show you. I'm going to show you some stuff first, and then Fowler's going to take over, and then we're going to go a little bit of back and forward. Um, if, you've got, if you're online, please ask questions. We can see them, and if there are things that we can uh, answer while we're going, we'll do our best to do so. We'll also have some question time at the end for folks in the room and for folks online as well. So, with no further ado, what's that? De Damien, David, do we... Oh, who am I? And who are you? Yeah. David. Fowler. And you're my PM. And I... <laughs> so, I'm going to write PM code, and then Fowler is going to fix it, because he's an actual engineer. I will judge you by watching you on screen very yeah. closely. And you will make me feel nervous. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is rate limiting in ASP.NET Core. Um, it's quite common when building large-scale systems, or even not so large-scale systems, that you might have parts of your application that you want to govern or protect through some type of rate limiting. Okay, it might be that you just want to only allow a certain number of concurrent uh, connections or requests at a certain amount of time. You might want to say, for people with this type of account, you only get this many requests for this endpoint in every 10 minutes, or it might be something a lot more complicated than that. Than that. So in .NET 7, there is a new set of APIs and primitives that you can use in ASP.NET Core to build these types of rate limiting solutions straight into your application. So we're just going to show you a fairly simple one here to get you a, a sense of how this fits together. So at the top here where I'm building out my DI container, I'm adding the rate limiter services to my application. The options for those, let me configure a couple of things, obviously. The first one here on line 11 on rejected, it says, hey, if something is rejected as a result of a rate limit, I'm going to go down and run this method, which I'll show you in just a moment, the on rate limit rejected method. But the most important part here is the actual policy. What am I uh, configuring my rate limiting to do in this application? Well, I'm creating a policy called five requests every 10 seconds per session, uh, where a session is a different user in this case. That's long. It is kind of long. I, I like descriptive names. I'm a PM. Yeah. So uh, th this, this, I think, is very descriptive. And it means I don't forget what this policy does. I don't have to read the code. Um, then it says, uh, given the context, it's going to call this callback and say, let's build ourselves a fixed window rate limiter. So for a fixed window of time, how many things are allowed to happen in that fixed uh, window of time? Uh, the first thing I have to pass in here is a partition key. What am I going to partition this limiter by? So you can think of a, of a limiter system as one where someone approaches and says, I want to perform this action. The action is governed by a limiter. And so a lease is created that says, yes, you are able to do this, and here are the conditions of you doing so. If for some reason you are rejected, that lease will be in the failed state, and then you can do things with that if you want to respond to the user in a certain way. So to identify different users or to partition this limiter, I'm using a custom cookie that I just made up with a GUID in it. Right? It's nothing very uh, complicated. You can use whatever you want to partition your limiters. And then I'm returning here a new uh, 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 set of options for this uh, fixed window rate limiter. I'm saying, hey, it's a 10-second window. I'm going to allow five within that window, and I don't want any queuing. So if it gets over five, I just want it to fail. The lease will fail immediately rather than the request hanging until uh, the limit is up. Damien, yeah, that syntax, that new, what is that? So this is called target type new. This was in C Sharp 11, I think, last year's release. Um, and it means that if you've got APIs like this where you need to return something that the compiler knows the type already, or you're assigning to a variable that's already typed that the compiler knows, I can just say new, and it takes care of, oh, I know what this is. You don't have to type it. Uh, it works out really nice here, don't you I'm think? not sure. You're not sure? Mm -hmm. OK, well, we, this is what we live for. We debate these things. Every time a new language feature comes out, we all gripe at each other about whether we like it or not. But I tend to like it in this type of, situ uh, this type of situation. So here's my custom middleware that I'm using to create my session ID. I didn't want full-blown session for this particular uh, demonstration, so I'm just creating a cookie, and I'm throwing it in. And if it's not there, I create one. Otherwise, the limiter is going to use it. And let, let's get down to the real interesting part here. I've got two endpoints. One that's Hello World, and the second one called Limited, you can see I've chained this call to require rate limiting, and I've passed the name of that policy. So this is metadata that gets attached to this endpoint, so that if I hit this endpoint, this is the one that is actually limited. So I'm going to start this application, and I'm going to uh, do two windows. I'm going to do an in-private window, and I'm going to do the first window. 
And so that we can see that this limit applies differently to different users, or in this case, uh, sessions. So if I hit execute down here, we can see this API is limited. That's what it came back with. And if I hit execute a few more times, oh, it says too many requests. Okay, and that's gonna reset after that 10 seconds. So if I keep talking for a little bit, and then I hit execute, it's working again. But if I come over to this other window, which is a different user, we can see if I get this one too many, and then I hit execute, and this one's working just fine. So I've got different limits applying to different users because my partition key was that custom session ID uh, that I created. Now, when it comes to the behavior of, oh, it rejected it with that 422, or 429, too many requests, that's that on rate limit rejected method that I showed you before that I was passing to the options. You can see it's very straightforward. You get a context, you get a cancellation token, and then I'm retrieving from the lease, uh, tell me how much time the user has left before they can try again, so that I can reply with the appropriate HTTP response code and headers, and then that gets sent straight back to the, uh, to the, to the request, and that's it. That's rate limiting, yep. super, super, super quick. All right. Cool. Go for it. What's next? All right, logging. Um, so everyone knows that logging has been part of .NET Core since inception, right? We have a, an, an iLogger, there's, there's event source, there's all, all kinds of ways to log events and systems um, in .NET. Um, we added in .NET 6 a thing called request logging. So in some applications, people want to log the entire request and response. They want to log the headers, um, their values, the bodies, if they want to, for auditing and, and, and whatnot. Um, looking around, um, what I saw in, even internally at Microsoft and you know, in the open source and in, in um, big companies, people that logging these things would write very, very code that was not efficient. So let me show you an example of what that could look like today. You're, you're in full screen mode. Alt shift, yeah. This is Damien's laptop. Alt, Alt shift enter. Alt shift enter. There we go. Back to the screen. All right. So here is an application. Um, and here's a big warning don't do this. If you have this, don't feel guilty. This is what everyone would do um, by default. All right. So I have a piece of code in the application that runs every request, and it buffers the entire request body, right? Because you need to actually replay the request after having logged that data. So hang on, the request is coming in. I want to read the data from the request so I can right. log it, but then I have to rewind the request effectively right. so that my app can actually use that data. Right, okay. so you're logging the headers first, so you create a string builder as you would. You log every header here, and then you log, that, log it to the, to the response via whatever you want to log to. Um, and then we read the entire request body using a stream reader, which pulls the entire thing into memory as a giant string, and then logs that information to the, lo to the system as well. And then we reset the, re Memory's reset cheap, the logs. Right? So that's fine. Memory is super cheap. Actually, okay. it really is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Storage is cheap. Um, so we reset the position of the body um, to make sure that other code that runs in the pipeline can read the body again. So it's happening twice, right, per request. Not, not great. Um, and then for the response, it's interesting. The pattern here is you need to set a sync or a stream as the response body so that other code that runs can write into the body. You catch all the data, and then you log it as well. So you replace the response body stream with so your you, own stream. Exactly. So the typical okay. pattern here in ASP.NET Core is you, you store the old body, right, the current body, and then you set a new body, which is the one to capture all the content. You write into it. by So you call next. That runs the, the pipeline that does routes and MBC and stuff. That unwinds. By that time, you've written the entire response body into memory as a giant array, because why not? And then you re-encode that byte array into a string that's UTF-8, hopefully, and then you log it to the system as well. This code makes me like anxious. And then we, to finish it off, we get, get the same buffer that we buffered for the response, and then we write that back to, to, the, to the actual output stream. right? So this is the typical dance that you see in anyone trying to do, write this code in, in production. right? Um, it's not, there are things wrong with it. I don't want to judge anyone if, if you have this code. It's in very app, difficult in your to get this right. right. To so, get this written in a way that is efficient, correct, and doesn't no, impact the system in No one said secure. So, oh, so a secure. couple of issues, right? So <laughs> performance is one thing. So I'm reading the entire body into memory, literally as one string. Mm. So stream reader, like, this is super um, convenient. You create a stream, a, a stream reader, you read the entire thing as a string, and you log it. That's super convenient. And you get it as a single. Um, um, entry in, in, in logs. Right. But that might have issues if the client sends a giant message. So if you can control the endpoint, if you know what size payloads will come to that endpoint, you may want to you, you may want to have the size be be um, a limit that isn't huge, so you can actually prevent that from from um, from affecting performance of, of your application. Mm. Um, so this is typical. It's not not the worst thing in the world. So but you've seen code like this everywhere. In customers everywhere. Okay. After seeing this pattern a couple of times, we kind of went. You know, maybe we should build a thing that is more efficient here that does the code that nobody wants to write because that's, that's really, it's, it's more difficult to write that code. Okay. 
Um, so blow me away. How easy is it now? Ha ha. So there's a new feature in this region, hidden region that no one can see. <laughs> I'll expose it. And there are two new features. Let's go through this one first. Um, HTTP logging is a new feature in ASP.NET Core in, in .NET 6. Um, and it basically does this for you. And it does two things that, that are really interesting. You can specify what things you want to log. So there's an enum here. I can say I want, a, I want headers, I want the body, I want the um, see, request headers, response headers, properties, body. Mm. And that's flagged, so I can just and like. It's flagged enum. Okay. I, can, I can combine these to say I want this, I don't want that. Um, you can say I want the path, the request. You can get as, as, as small as you or want. Or I can just say all. Just or give I can me say all. all. Okay. I'm lazy. So I want to log everything. But the other part of this that's interesting is in this default case, I guess I, guess I should show this running first and make sure it actually does run. Let me change the startup project to be request logging. And I'll run this, and hopefully it works. Starts minimized. And there it is. Awesome. Woo, works great. So that's all the, that's the browser request that was sent. This is the, yeah, the, the, the And then the outgoing as well. Yep. Okay. So you get the request data and the response data. Not very attractive to look at, though. Um, so now let's use the built-in logging feature in ASP.NET Core. I will minimize this. Don't do this. Okay. And then middleware part, we'll do our hidden region. Use HTTP logging. This is the middleware, and this is the way to configure it. So I'll tell it, you know, log all the things. I'll run this again, and it should show me data. Oh. So this is an example of a log from the HTTP logging middleware. And you can see it does a couple of interesting things. It logs the request path, the protocol, all the things as key value pairs, all the headers. But it has this thing called redacted. So we have a default notion of which headers are safe and which ones are unsafe by default. So you can, and, and, it, and this is also configurable via options. Um, but the other thing I didn't mention was security. Do you want to log auth tokens? Do you want to log things that may be insecure that come in mm. the request body? That, so that's one of the other things that comes up that I think people, that isn't considered when people write this, the simple code. How do you handle redacting things that may be sensitive? Because what about privacy like, yeah, concerns and things like that? Privacy concerns, like, okay. yeah, exactly. Do you want to get sued and get hacked by you know, right. GTR or guidance right. and stuff? Because so, these logs could go into some other system that exactly. maybe doesn't have the protections of your production database and those exactly. types of things, right? Okay. So there's a, there's a notion of, of, of um, trying to redact headers. And the way that works is, by default, we have a, a known set of headers that are safe and ones that are unsafe. So for example, the, the auth header, the auth token, that's not there by default. Right, right. And you can add your own. So for example. The authorization header. Yeah. Yep. You could be like, content lengths are super scary. So you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but maybe it is. Okay. And, and adding to this list says re print, the, print the key, but the value is, isn't there anymore. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, the, other, the other feature it has is request body limit. So by default, we buffer the request on your behalf. And as you read the body, we actually wrote all the crazy code to manage buffering efficiently. And as you read the stream, it will buffer to a background, a, 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 a pool, pool buffer, um, and it will go it, it will go to disk as it needs to, um, et cetera. So this isn't going to destroy my It does my all the hard collection. code for you, right? Yeah. It, it's it does not all the code on that memory. Correct. Okay. It does the code in the right way to make it so, so, so that it's, it's efficient. Okay. Um, and the other knob is if you just want to log the first couple of bytes from, from the request, not the entire thing, you can limit the body. Mm. So let me show you what that looks like in Postman. Ooh. This is a brand new Postman. Look at that. No request. I reimaged my laptop yesterday. <laughs> so everything is shiny and new. So I'm going to send a raw JSON request. Uh, it should be JSON to this endpoint. First, let me, let me make sure this works. And then, like, my age is, like, young. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Your personal trainer is wonderful. I should get Young at heart. Well. <laughs> Does that work? Did it, did it blow up? Did it work? So I have what I have here. Post to this, record, this, this URL. Oh, I did HTTPS. Is that why it's complaining at me? Yeah. Ha ha! Disable it. You never care about it. You're doing a get right now, and yes, it's these. Like, yes. That's two yeah, things. It yeah, was two, two things. things. Two things. <laughs> All right. Well works. done. And it's correct. Um, so let's now look at the output of this in the browser. And you can see it logged the wait. Was it running? It had to be running. There it is, the body that came in, the request body, and the response body, right? Super simple. Nice. Now, let's do something crazy and increase this to a giant, giant. I have this big JSON payload that I just. How, how big? 28 kilobytes. Okay, that's nearly, oh, 
Okay, that is big. Bigger than the large. I mean, it's not. I hear like people saying megabyte. Five megs. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're right. Multi megabyte. Probably bigger. This Someone is in the audience is sitting there going, oh, "That's tiny." A lot bigger than that. So it logs the whole thing. This is this is what you want. So you're in your log, <laughs> and you're, you're scanning your logs, and you're seeing these giant payloads. But if I wanted to redact something in the body, is that possible? Huh? That's a little hard, obviously. <laughs> Much harder, because that requires understanding what the body is and, right. and scanning it. Effectively and, parsing it. But that is still like That's a, a custom lot. thing, if yeah. you wanted to be able to do that. Okay. Good luck. Fair enough. Fair enough. That makes sense. No, no. <laughs> um, but this is much better. Like, having this ability better. in the box, I imagine. It's and it's efficient by default. OK. So Excellent. I'm going to log the first 1K of, of um, buffer. That, that rebooted. That should just work. Beautiful. Wait. Wait. Oh, that's, that's the wrong one. Which app am I at? Rate limiting? This one. This one? Nope. Not that one's ended. If only I knew it. Oh, there we, there we go. <laughs> All right, is that it? Let's, let's see if it works. It's fine. Post. And it should have truncated the. Oh, yes. that's, that's the response body. It did. So the request body is truncated. This is the first whatever, 1K of the JSON payload. Not useful, but you know, if, if you did have something that it might be enough to that, debug that's okay or, to truncated, right. you may want to have something that, that isn't the entire payload so you can actually debug what's, what's going on. OK, so this looks like super feature rich and super yep. impressive given how difficult the other things sound to do. How hard was this to build for us, like quickly? Like, we have experience like doing time. some things in MVC and yeah. stuff. Like, we, we do efficient things to ensure that if large bodies or large yeah. responses, we try not to. But that has a lot of stuff in it. I mean, that's kind of impressive. It was tough. Actually. I think one of the hardest parts was figuring out redaction and security. OK. Um, so having a model where you want to like, opt into things mm -hmm. and like, opt out of things, we, that, that, that was kind of a new paradigm in the platform we have to kind of build in. OK. Um, we, we don't have a concept of, of, of redaction from logs in, the, in .NET, so that was a, a, thing to, that, a thing to build in here. Cool. Um, I guess the one other thing I would show is we have this thing called W3C logging. If you've ever used IIS, there are these logs that it spits out um, on disk by default. So we have this, this other um, piece of component that runs in the pipeline that lets you get those logs back. So if you had you know, tools that script those logs and figured out, you know, um, that, that give you stats on those logs, right, et cetera, right. um, you can now use that same tooling on .NET. So this is like web server level logging this as opposed to application level, log. level logging. Right, right, so I turn on that, that, um, that, middle, that, that, that component, and then I add, um, add it to the pipeline. I say I want to log all the fields. Mm -hmm. This also isn't the, the same pattern where it has a flags enum, so you can turn on individual fields that you want to um, see. And then I get a logs folder by default in the application. Oh, it goes in the fold? Okay. You can change it. <laughs> you, you can configure where it goes and when right. it buffers and when it, when it rolls over to the next, right, next right. Um, um, file. Okay. And it shows you the typical IS style logs where it has a table of fields and the date, time, IP address, um, name. And because this log format has been around for a long time due to Windows and IIS, yeah, there are lots of tools that I, know how to scrape this. I'm not sure it's IIS specific, but I don't think I, it is, all, actually. all the tools, yeah. do, um, Logman and stuff, um, can read this and uh, can process it. And, okay. it and that was .NET 6 as well? Yep. OK. Yep, yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right, next. next. There were a couple of questions very quickly. Uh, why, going back to rate limiting for a moment, what are good reasons to implement uh, rate limiting in the API instead of the gateway? Um, there are, well, you might write your gateway in ASP.NET Core for a ah, start, yeah. right? Which, yep. you know, some teams might do and some people at Microsoft might be doing. Um, and so it's nice to have these features available no matter what part of your solution, the ASP.NET Core part is satisfying. Uh, why two different namespaces for, for rate limiting? Part of the rate limiting is in the BCL, system dot something, right? The other part of rate limiting is in ASP.NET Core. So that's in Microsoft.ASP.NET Core to rate limiting. And the ASP.NET Core stuff builds on top of the stuff the that's components. in the core components. That's why there are two. The first, for the first question, you might also want to protect the resources on a specific machine. You may want to protect memory. So you may want to have a, concurrent limit, a concurrency limit on one node because you want to say, I don't want to have more than n concurrent requests. Mm. You may want to limit, limit um, the resources because you know it only works well for this, much, this many concurrent um, things, right? So right. There's kind of two layers. You could do it at the front end as well, but you're also protecting a different set of resources when you do it on the specific node. Um, right. Yeah. OK. I, mean, I imagine if you were trying to do complex rate limiting where you wanted to tie it to an account or some type of paid subscription, right. 
uh, the gateway you're using may not have support for you know, integrating that level of detail into the rate limit rule. Yep. So you might, as you said, do one lot of rate limiting at the front, which is more static, and then do more dynamic rate limiting where all your application logic in is. Process, in right. process, right. Okay, so let's move on to caching. Uh, ASP.NET Core has had some form of response caching for quite a while now, uh, but I'm gonna show you why perhaps that wasn't actually what you wanted and what we've done in .NET 7, just coming, uh, to make this a little bit better. So I have an application here, if I run this one, uh, it, it renders me a little monster. And this monster comes from the Gravatar service, and so if I hit F5 over and over again, I get a new one, okay? New monster every single time, and there's a, if I zoom in, you can see that there's a timestamp there to tell me when that was rendered, okay? Fairly straightforward. So if I wanna go ahead and add some caching to this, so rather than getting a new image every time, there's some type of caching, well, there's a few things I can do. Let me go down here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and add a middleware in front of this, which is uh, use response caching, like so. Okay, no problem. Uh, that puts the middleware in the pipeline. This has been available, like I said, for a few versions in ASP.NET Core. And then I'm gonna grab this block of code down here uh, so that I can actually configure this from inside my endpoint uh, to configure what this caching is going to do. So I'm gonna add this here. I'll uncomment that. And so what does this code do? Well, it grabs a feature out of the uh, HTTP context, which is our response caching feature. In here, I can set a property that says I want you to vary the cache by query keys, which is very common, obviously, if I send a query string of some sort. In this case, I'm accepting size via the query string because I don't have it in my route, so it'll come through as a query string value. So I want to vary by that. And then I go ahead and say, let's set some caching here. I said public is true, and I want it to cache every five seconds. So if I rebuild that, and I come back over here and I hit refresh. Now, if I hit refresh every time, it's not working. And you go, well, that's unusual. Why is that not working? I just set up caching. If I hit this load thing down here, oh, it does start working. And this is where we start getting into the intricacies of caching in HTTP and on the web, and how, how the user agent behaves when it comes to caching, and how the server might behave. So the response caching in an ASP.NET Core to date has been what you would term strict HTTP caching. So it uses the HTTP cache uh, standards, the cache control header, to control on the way in and on the way out what the caching behavior will be. And so you probably know that when you hit refresh in a browser, the browser doesn't send the same request it did the time before. It slightly modifies it. It adds a header that says, oh, this is a refresh. I want you to not cache the response. And if you didn't know that, now you do. That's why hitting F5 in the browser is different to hitting a link that goes to the same URL as the current page, which is the difference between these two here. The browser, when you click the link, will go, oh, this is cached. I cached this previously. They didn't hit refresh. They just navigated. So I'm going to give you something that's satisfied from the cache. And if I open up F12, and we watch the network here, and I hit load, and I hit load again, what we'll see, if I can see these things, is over here on you'll see it says these were fulfilled by disk cache and memory cache. The browser tools are telling me that these things weren't actually sent to the server. And then if I wait a little bit longer and then I do it again, we'll see that this time that's not the case because I only set it to cache every five seconds. And you might be saying, well, that's great, Damien. You explain how all that stuff works. That's not what I want. I don't want my cache to be invalidated because the user hit F5. That's not what I expect from application level caching. That's what we've fixed for you in ASP.NET Core 7. So there is now a new caching system that's available, which you can use right alongside the existing caching system, and it's called Output Cache. And for those who have been using ASP.NET for quite a long time, before we had ASP.NET Core, we had System Web, and that had a feature called Output Caching, which worked very similarly to what I'm about to show you here. So instead of using Response Caching, or next to it, I can say, let's use Output Caching this time. So now I have a middleware in my pipeline. I think this one requires services as well. Yep. So I'll say add. Services.add. It helps if I do that. Add output cache, okay, like so. So now I've got my output cache services and I've got my output cache. Now this system is more modern than the, result ca uh, the response caching that we have in ASP.NET Core. So rather than doing all of this where I had to manually set up a bunch of stuff per endpoint, I can use the endpoint and routing metadata system to control which endpoints get cached. And so to do that, at the end of this endpoint definition here, so remember this is my handler, and at the end of this I can call other methods to attach more behavior to this endpoint by way of metadata. So we have a new method here that will give me output cache. I can say cache output, and I can just pass it nothing. So if I do this this time, and I go back, 
and I refresh this page. Okay, so now, no matter how many times I hit refresh, it's just giving me the same response. You can see that time span, time, at, uh, time stamp there is not changing. Now, just like any good caching system, you can configure this in all the same ways that you would expect. You can set up vary by for all the normal things like headers and user and uh, query strings and all the rest of it. You can create a custom key if that's what you need to be able to do from custom, beats of, uh, custom pieces of metadata. Um, and because it's based on metadata, like it is here, you can apply this to endpoints directly or you can apply it by way of policy. So you can create a, basically a cache rule with a whole bunch of things, give that a name, like a cache policy of whatever you want to call it, cache this thing for 10 seconds, and then you can apply that to certain things by name. Very similar to how you can do so with authorization today and how you can do with rate limiting like I showed you before. So that is output caching in ASP.NET Core 7. Awesome. Awesome. Next, what do we have next? Counters and performance. Well, that was like a smattering of applause. Ah, applause? Holy crap. It's a cool feature. <laughs> mm. Funny, it's Damien's feature that he asked for, I think, when we did. I think I logged the issue for this. Point thing. one, like in, in like maybe four versions ago. And then it took us four versions to build Apple Caching, but we've finally done it. All right, so there are some questions I want to take quickly. Hyperlogging. Yep. What if we want to log some properties from the body and hide others if they are sensitive data? Oh, from the body. The body. This is the what I mentioned, the hard part. redaction yeah. in the body. Um, the body is not structured to this system. It's just bytes. And so there's no way for us to kind of carve pieces out. Today. At, at today. As Fowler said, if you wanted to do this manually today, you would have to basically write a filter, like a stream filter kind of thing, or something that was rule-based. He said, look for these patterns. It's and tough. It's kind of hard, but we don't have that today. That's but something it, you have to do yourself. It is useful, so yeah. we might put it in the future. Uh, does the W3C logging work in Azure PaaS? Uh, so like an Azure app, Azure app service? Good question. I, I believe you could, you could turn it on, and it would end up on disk in Azure app service. In so the OIS-based one? It would work yeah. in that sense. I guess, is there more to that question? Like, would, would, would anything consume it? Not, no. No, but you could turn okay. it on in your app, because it's just in your app, and it'll yeah. just go to the, to the application. OK. Are the fields extensible in, in the W3C one? Ooh, good question. Can you I, add information from I, your own middleware? I think that schema is pretty fixed. Um, I think it's not um, extensible. OK. What about the other logging, the full request logging? The full request one, you can add headers. You can add any header. Yeah. OK, if you wanted to add other random fields, though, you, header would, and body. you, you would just add log things, them yeah. yourself. That's right. OK, yep. no problem. OK, and last one for, for now. Is rate limiting in memory only out of the box, or is it possible to implement distributed rate limiting Such in a good question. setup that by Redis Cache or similar? So yes, in the box is uh, in process, in memory based uh, rate limiting, but we do have examples available uh, for distributed rate limiting using things like Redis. Uh, I think Orleans one has been looked at yep. as well. Um, and so you know, often you, you'll be needing to implement these things so that they rate limit even if the same endpoint, same customer, in, uh, hits one instance of your app and then it gets load balanced to another instance. You want that rate limit to still apply. You don't want them to suddenly get a fresh new lease over there. So yes, it, the system does support that and you can write your own to do so. All right. Cool. So we have, so we have like, 15 issues yep. left. We should figure out which things we think we should, you want to show the most. Oh. So there's a lot of stuff to show. I can do problem details. Problem details is probably a good one to show. Yep. All right. And then we can maybe look Dig at some of your patterns. Stuff. Sound good? Yep. All right. So problem details. Problem details is an RFC. I can't remember. It's got a seven in it. Four, seven, um, two, or three, six. <laughs> uh, about a standard schema for responding uh, with JSON when an error occurs for an API. We added support for problem details in MVC back in HBNet Core 3, I want to say, that, that was a while ago. Um, and for API controllers, it does that by default. Uh, if you have any type of uh, validation error or any exception, it'll do that for you. Um, and then there's kind of some primitives. There's a problem details type. But there's really no other part of the system that will return problem details for you. In ASP.NET Core 6, we introduced minimal APIs with this new sort of results dots, and you can return problem details from that, and that you just write the code to do so, and that works. But what about your exception handler? What about the developer exception page? What about other things that might return errors? Wouldn't it be great if you could just configure all of those to use uh, problem details as well? Well, that's something that we've enabled in ASP.NET Core 6. Now, I do want to also mention that before that, there has been a, you know, some popular middleware in the community for doing this before now, and they still work great. So some of you might be using those already. Um, if you want to just put something in your pipeline and have everything get caught and then formatted uh, as a problem details, you can still do that. That's not a problem at all. But we do now have um, uh, new built-in support for this in ASP.NET Core, and it hooks up to a number of the primitives by default. So if I go ahead and add problem details here in my services, which I have, uh, that's kind of 
all I have to do by default in order to get a few of the existing components to now work with problem details. The first one is status code, status code pages. So if you haven't seen st status code pages before, it's a middleware that sits in the pipeline, and then any endpoint, any response that's coming back that sets a status code without any body, typically, the status code pages can modify the response. So rather than being an empty body, it will format you a nice body for status code you know, 30 whatever or 4 or whatever it is that you want to be. So if I go ahead and run this application, here's my swagger. I'm going to just zoom in back out a little bit. So here's my status endpoint. I'm going to say, hey, let's try this out. I'm going to just make up a status code that doesn't exist. We'll say execute 123. And that's running. It's taking an awful long time. That is not that one. We have so many things running now. <laughs> that's not that one. Mm. Let's cancel that one. Refresh that page. <laughs> Try that again. Let's make sure Hello World works. Okay, that works well. There's my Hello World. Very, very good. Let me do the, uh, I've got an endpoint here that will throw an exception if I execute it. Okay, so there we go. So I've got an endpoint that if you hit it, it throws an exception. If we have a look in here, we can see it's actually returning with, uh, with it's returning JSON. Yeah, and this is the problem details service doing its work for you as a result of me adding the exception handler. So you've probably used the exception handler before. Let me go back to my application, this method right here. This form of using the exception handler has not been supported until ASP.NET Core 7, though. You typically have to pass arguments to say, well, what do you want to do when an exception takes place? Do you want to redirect, uh, rerun the pipeline, I should say, at this path? Do you want to run this code? Uh, now you can give no arguments at all, and as long as you've added problem details, it'll actually just go, okay, well, you've got problem details configured. I'm just going to return problem details, assuming that the client supports JSON. If the client doesn't support JSON, it'll just format it in plain text. Okay, so you've got a very nice, very simple, safe, safe. Only logs, you know, safe stuff. It doesn't give you all the stack traces and stuff like the developer exception page does. By default in the box now, which is kind of nice. Um, I've also got an API controller down here. So if I scroll down, all the way down, I've got a greetings controller, the API controller that I talked about before. Um, and I just want to show that this service that's new in 7 that you could customize will plug into all the places that understand problem details in ASP.NET Core. So if I go back to my application now, and we try and hit the greetings, let me try that out, hit execute. OK, so that's working. But if I hit it again, oh, this one, uh, I logged an error. So I actually set up this endpoint so that if the current time ends in an odd second, it throws an exception, because it makes it really easy to demo, right? <laughs> I say, so if I just keep hitting execute here, sometimes it'll work, and then, and then, then it throws, OK? Super nice. And so what it says down here is I've got my problem details, and you'll note that it actually puts the trace ID in there for me automatically, which is super, super nice. But what if I want to add my own fields to this problem details and have them show up everywhere where problem details is returned by my application? Well, you can customize the problem details. So I've got a, a method here, customize problem details, which I'm going to hook up now. So if I go back to where I add problem details and I just pass it this customize problem details method group, I'll show you what that code does. It's pretty straightforward. It's like most stuff that you would see in ASP.NET Core. We'll just hide this one. I get a set of options, and then inside this I can set a delegate that will get called, and then the context that gets passed to me when a problem details is being formatted allows me to go ahead and do whatever I, it is that I want to do with it. In this case, I'm adding a property called node ID, and I'm just putting my machine name in there, okay? So if I rebuild this now, and I go back to the application, and I run the exact same thing, and I'm doing this in the API controller, I hit execute, you can see now that that node ID property is showing up in problem details. And the problem details spec supports extensions. It, there's a minimum amount of things that you're supposed to have in there, but then it's free. you're free to go off and add out other things in there as well. And because it's all one format, it's all JSON, the client should be able to handle that without any problem. So that is problem details awesome. in ASP.NET Core 7. All right. Okay, what's, all right. what's more? more stuff. Yay, more claps, more claps. It's encouragement, it's fuel. OK, so we have a ton of stuff to show you. Um, that was kind of the, the new features and, and new things in 6 and 7. Now we're going to kind of dive into kind of patterns and cool things that you probably wouldn't have known about because they weren't advertised on the blogs. They're kind of like things you can do if you knew how all the things worked. Mm. So let's start by doing an interesting one, startup hooks. Startup hooks. Yeah, this is kind of like the super sneaky thing that we did in .NET, I don't even know what version, was it .NET 3 or, or, or 5? Something. Um, the intent of this feature is you can set an environment variable for your process. To a, a point to a DLL. And we will call an entry point in that DLL before main runs. So think about all the cool things you can do with that. You can inject code into any process that runs.NET 
and then run code before main run. So that's not ASP.NET, that's .NET. This is .NET as a yes. whole. Sounds like a virus. Like. OK, you need to be able to control the environment <laughs> variables. If you've got access okay. to be able to control environment variables, you've got access to do anything you want. So Disclaimer. <laughs> Disclaimer. Um, OK, so I have an application here. It's a, it's a vanilla application in .NET 7 preview. OK. And this, just, just says hello world. So I'll, I'll run it first to make sure that there's, it works well. Nothing on my sleeves. Awesome, hello world. I left a comment there saying that, you know, don't forget to set the set startup the variable. Okay. Set, set the variable. Um, what this feature does is it lets me write code that runs before main. So I have this um, class library. It has a class. The class has to be top level, not in a namespace. It has to have this name, startup hook. Okay. And it has to have a public static method called initialize. And, that's, and this, this is the entry point. So there's no interface. There's no base class. No interface. This is just no dependencies, no base classes. matching, basically. I look for a class. And if it's got this method right. and the environment variable is set to point to that assembly, right. and I find all those things, we will call it. We'll call it. Okay. It's like program main, right? Program main isn't an interface. That's it's true. just a, an entry okay. point in a, in, in a DLL somewhere. So I'm going to build this. Again, rebuild. I'll get the path to it. This path, let me, with it, control plus. I'm out of like practice. How do you zoom in? How do you zoom in? Windows key plus. Windows key plus. I was like, you zoom in somewhere. <laughs> Grab this. All right. Copy this into my launch settings. So launch settings, everyone should know what this is. This is how VS configures what to pass into the application on launch. And .NET run. And .NET run. So I can come to the HTTPS because this is actually selected. I'm running it. I can set the startup hooks to be this DLL. And you can do more than one via a semicolon. Oh, I can have multiple startup semicolon. hooks? You can okay. do more than one. I'll set this. And now I'll put a breakpoint in the startup hook itself so we can see it being called. And if I F5 this. <gasps> wow. So I, to be clear, that was a class library. You can't launch that. You launch the right. other app. But it's calling this code before program main. How do I know it didn't call your app first? Hmm, good point. Good point. OK, okay let's prove it. Let's prove it. Let's, let's prove it. it. OK. So first of all, I'm going to, you have these settings that I just don't like in VS. It's brand new install of Visual Studio. <laughs> this is, this, these, are, these, are PM, these are PM settings. <laughs> PM settings. I'll forgive you. Oh, just my code. OK, yeah, so <laughs> going to main, I'll put a breakpoint in the entry point. This is, this is the main method. All right, so this, in theory, this should run before main. So good. Runs. OK, so OK, hang on. That's cool. But what can I really do from there? Like, I can't see the app code, right? I can't really do anything that's interesting. Haha. Uh -huh. okay. So we have this kind of interesting thing used for diagnostics that we've used in interesting ways to, to kind of do these kind of interesting hacks. <laughs> I, I like things. how you keep saying interesting. Interesting. I don't want to say hacky. It's for magical, it's scary beautiful, things. beautiful. Okay. So I have some code here that hooks up to every instance of the host builder that, that, that is created in the process. OK. And I can add services on the fly to anything in the process. Definitely a virus. OK, so this is. <laughs> but the good kind of virus. <laughs> this is a good kind of virus. Anti this is like antibodies? an engineered virus antibodies. designed to target a disease. I see. Like a movie. OK. Like a virus. Movie. Okay. So I subscribe to that um, event listener. I do some magic. I find the right one, the one from extensions hosting. I subscribe to it again. Um, then I get an event saying the host is being built. And the value I know, because I added this code, um, is a host builder. And I can change the environment to magic. So when I run the app, it should have an environment that isn't development or production. It should be, it should okay, be magic. So in theory, I could set this environment variable for a whole machine. I could put the DLL in a location <laughs> on that machine. And then every .NET app on that machine, if it was ASP.NET Core, would now be running in an environment called magic. This is correct. OK. Which so, I could have just done with an environment variable, because ASP.NET Core lets you set the environment name from an environment variable. Don't ruin the demo. Sorry. But if I wanted to do something else, I could, I could have done that as well. I can add services, configuration, logging. Okay. You can build cross-cutting things that kind of affect every app. So you can do cool stuff like, I want every app to have a logger. I want every app to have these things. And this is one way of kind of getting yourself injected into the process without having devs have to write code could or I add a base controller? class. You can definitely I could I can, add like an endpoint to every app. This is all powerful. This is like God mode. This is pretty cool. So I run this. And if I look at the 16th window that we have open, <laughs> the environment name is magic. Isn't that scary? That's awesome. Scary awesome. Very cool. Awesome. So we actually use this. So Visual Studio uses this to inject tooling into your process when you launch from Visual Studio. You didn't even uh, Azure uses this to inject certain things into your app when you enable things in your app that didn't require you to change code.
right? This is how they do that. Sneaky. So you can utilize this to do things in a cross-cutting fashion without your app having to be changed at all. Now, with great power comes great responsibility. Nah. The code that you write in that startup hook, if it throws an exception that is not caught, what happens to the app? You try catch. You swallow it. Yeah. <laughs> Let the app if, run. Well, the app can't try catch it. Your, the startup hook has to try Just catch be careful. it. Careful, let it, let it. So yeah. You have to be very careful with the code that you write in here. Okay, but it's incredibly powerful. All right, we are under five minutes. I want to show one more demo before we go to questions. You're going to show it? The trimming. Like, have, well, oh, we're going to make the smallest app. The, the, the big one. Okay, the big one. Okay, you got to do it. All right. So, Damien has been coding all week on this thing, and he wants to show it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it was in the description for the talk. He's so, so proud. He's so proud of it. Right. I'm proud of you too. So, who, um, I, I'm assuming that there are people here who have heard and are watching online who have s uh, heard about .NET native AOT. There's been a long uh, sort of history of what would it mean, how cool would it be if I could take .NET and I could run it uh, or compile it down to a native, a native executable, something really, really small, okay? Uh, smaller, faster, uses less memory. That's kind of the, the, the promise that we have. So, if I'm just going to jump out here and I'm going to go to another a folder I have called trim to do. And for those who are interested in looking at this afterwards, this is up on my GitHub repo, github.com slash Damien Edwards slash trimmed to do, is where I'm investigating kind of this, this interesting area uh, to do with .NET trimming and .NET AOT, .NET native AOT, which are somewhat related. Na uh, native AOT uses trimming, okay? It's a uh, spectrum. So first you trim, spectrum. you trim, and you go native. Right. Or well, it's actually a, a larger spectrum, right? Because yeah. you go normal publish, framework dependent, uh, Self-contained publish, bring the runtime with me. Right. Single file. Single file. Publish. Huge executable, 100 megabytes, but now everything is in one exe. A trimmed single file where we knock out everything that you don't use, and there's different levels of trimming that you can turn up or down because it can be complicated, right, to make sure that it doesn't break your app. Then there's ready to run, which is like an extra thing that will add native bits back to your app so that you don't have to JIT to during improve, startup. To improve start time. But, but the it file makes size your app gets bigger. much bigger because there's native stuff. And then there's turn it to 11, which is AOT. Okay. Which is the JIT, and you just you throw it in the garbage. So uh, just, to land, just to finish here, I'm going to run a script which says hello world console. I need you to believe me, this console app is just hello world. It's all it does. Okay? All I'm doing here is building the application and passing the right flags to it so that it gets built. And then I want you to cast your eye to this part of the output here that tells you the, how big the final application was, which in this case was under a megabyte. And so I was able to create a console application, a .NET console application that does nothing else but say hello world, you know, granted. But the whole thing is a self-contained executable native with no JIT um, that is under a megabyte. I also have another one here that is a web app. So if I do hello world web, and I run that one, which I'm hoping will finish before we do, um, we can kind of see the difference. The repo has different grades. So it has like an empty web app, it has a stripped web app where I turn off a bunch of stuff, it has HTTP listener, and it has uh, sort of a, a prototype Kestrel Direct. Uh, so this one is 17 meg, quite a lot larger, because ASP.NET Core has a lot of features. Right? All the great stuff that we show you, that's all in the box. Uh, depending on what you got used, we then trim all of that out but we have to do more work in the framework to make it more trim friendly. So I, I encourage you to go and look at that if you're interested and have a look at how small uh, we can make those applications. And I want to, I want to let you know that we are working on this every single release to make it smaller and more compatible with the apps that you're running today. With that, we have about a minute and a half. So Mr. Hansman. To make it smaller, we delete code. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also streaming live on TikTok. So. Is it TikTok? That's nuts. Yeah. This is my first time on TikTok. Your first time on TikTok? Mm. Oh, it'll be your last time on TikTok okay, because <laughs> no, no one is interested in this content on, on TikTok. Cool. Well, we've only got one minute left, and you've already answered a couple of questions here. Uh, it looks like we're doing pretty awesome. Uh, did you answer this question here from Samuel saying about new project templates that include these kinds of middleware? Are you going to see that in .NET 7, any new templates? Probably not. No, oh, when man. it comes to templates, we tend to try and keep them fairly um, slim Thin. Um, because adding the, not everyone wants all this stuff. Every obviously. combination, every like, yeah. dial, you'd, you'd have too, too many templates, I think. Right. Yeah, so, no. All right, and then everything that you showed is out in the sense of it's in an RC of .NET 7. Either in 6 or it's in an RC of 7. You didn't That's show right. anything that was secret, and it's all in whose GitHub, yours? Uh, in my GitHub repo is this solution that we were talking, it's just Ignite 2022 at Damien Edwards uh, in GitHub. 
Um, and then the readme points to other ones if that's what you want to see. That's so cool that we can get to show you. Here. And oh. will that AOT stuff be like, is it supported or is right. it Right, so for .NET, in 7, for .NET 7, it is supported for console apps. So awesome. you can turn it on for console apps. For ASP.NET Core applications, you can turn it on and it might work, like this one right here. If you can make it work. But it's not supported yet. All right. It might trim things you don't want to trim. It will very it likely might. trim things that it shouldn't. It will and then definitely you have to fail. It will definitely you need a manifest to say don't trim that. Yeah, and then that, that experience isn't great. So there are ways to do it. Right. Yeah, there, right. there is to make it work. All right. Better. Well, that is the end of day one of our tech sessions here. Thank you very much, David and oh Damien. Thank you to all of our friends in the audience. I do also, uh, I want to give a shout out to all of the folks behind the scenes that you don't see, the folks that are doing the audio, the folks that are doing the video, our friends at the uh, ASL translators here, and all the other cast of thousands that make this stuff possible. I hope you have a wonderful time at MS Ignite, and I hope that you do join us tomorrow in this room as we have another six amazing technical sessions from people that you know and a couple people that you don't know. Make sure that you fill out your evals, please. It's super important. And also check out .NET Conf. We're going to have even more technical sessions and even more David and Damien at .NET Conf the first week of November, free online. So register for that. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks.